Hi, everybody. Welcome to me and to you. Um, it's really a pleasure and honor to be here. I'd like to start my talk with showing you what I do. So, should you run that? A little easier than explaining it. to show than to talk. Um, this is what I do. I'm a facilitator of intangibility. I take an idea, somebody's thought, a feeling, a sound, a music, and I turn it into concrete steps, moving people around the room, physical characterizations, anything that makes sense to whatever the directors told me. You know, I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Now, this is what I do and I'd like to talk to you about how I got there and got to do it. I've always been interested in uh, people, or reading about people who have overcome large obstacles in their lives and gone on to become leaders in their chosen field. Now, I'm interested because it's personal. I feel like, you know, if you don't know yourself, you certainly can't lead anybody else. They're kind of following a ghost, you know what I'm saying? If they aren't standing there, nothing to follow. Um, how many of you remember the film The Matrix? Yeah? Okay. Well, in the beginning of the movie, Morpheus says to Neo, which pill do you want to take? The blue one, which will take you back to what you know, plug you back into the matrix, or the red one, which is uncertain reality, the unknown? Well, there was a moment in my life where I had to choose which pill to take. Choose is the operative word here because I think everything's about choice. I was 19. Got pregnant, had a baby, unmarried, unplanned, whatever, bye-bye college. So uh, I thought, OK. So then in the hospital, delivering, next day, they bring this baby in to me. And I'm thinking, hmm, just something's wrong. Where's the kicking, screaming baby from the night before? This one's slightly blue, limp as a rag. And I'm like freaking out, going, nurses, you gave me somebody else's kid, right? Tried to calm me down. The doctor comes in, and he says, uh, looks as if the fluid wasn't cleared out of her lungs. She turned blue off and on during the night. Then he says, don't worry, she'll be okay. Well, she was not okay. They soon realized, you know, major brain damage, little activity, uh, 
can't be fixed, not going to, she's going to be retarded, she probably will not be able to speak. Okay, I'm feeling pretty hopeless right about then. So I think to myself, I've got to do something that makes me feel good about myself, whoops, <laughs> and restore hope. So I went back to my first passion, dancing. And I'm here to tell you it saved my life because that's where I felt free, open, and expressive. You know, um, it's, it's tricky. Uh, even though the doctors told me that there was not much going on, I always knew that there was. I could see it in her eyes, and I believed myself. One of my favorite stories is what I call the dictionary story. By that time, I had married a man who was a professor of English literature. He had all these books, gorgeous bound Oxford dictionary on an ornate stand in the living room. Occasionally, she'd mess with that book. She could get into the same kind of trouble any two-year-old. You know, the brain damage didn't stop that part. So one day, she comes into the room, and she's flipping the page. I say, Joni, stop it, right? Leaves the room, comes back in. Attitude is totally different now. She stands there and she looks at me and she goes, flip. <laughs> I'm like going, wait a second. There's something going on here. This kid gets cause and effect. So I'm like, going, all right, okay, I can do it. I can find that thing in her mind that's going to open it up and I'm going to get her to her full potential. So I think to myself, I'm going to teach her how to talk, even though they said, no, she's not going to talk. Well, around this time, she's beginning to respond to music. So I played everything I could think of uh, that might you know, inspire her, whatever. And so you know what she responded to the most? The Beatles, all you need is love, swear to God. Right? It's like listening to the words of Lennon and McCartney. She started imitating words and sounds. So I'm thinking, mm, what else is going on up there? <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, this kid could be very sort of little Yoda-like. And I, so I thought, well, I'm going to test her out, see what she understands about the world, you know, personal relationships, anything, constructs, what's marriage. So one day I say, Joni, so what do married people do? I swear to God, she looked brilliant simplicity. She looks at me and she goes, talk, do sex, hunt for food. <laughs> I mean, right? Is that the best <laughs> definition <laughs> you've ever heard, right? It's kind of, it's very true. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, it, life is funny. I probably never would have done any of this. Become a dancer in New York, had a dance company, learned to negotiate the pitfalls of Hollywood, and there are many. If I hadn't ha had to deal with the adversity of her handicap, you know, it taught me tenacity. It taught me to find solutions where none existed. You know, that's what you got to do. Um, I was used to operating without a template. Because what I do is kind of hard to explain. It always changes with whomever is in front of me, whatever animal I'm faced with. Kind of like what Jane said, you know, there it is. There's that person. Mm, what do you do? So my, my favorite job interview was with a director named Frank Oz. He did a film called In the Cupboard. Those of you who don't know who he is, he's the man who created Miss Piggy for The Muppets. Now I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be fun, right? <laughs> I go to the, the, to the interview, and totally filled with puppets. His family's been doing it forever. I'm sitting there, and he goes, and I've been recommended to him as an acting coach. By the way, not a choreographer. I kind of do that, too. It's all the same. You either is or you isn't, you know, <laughs> whether you're speaking or moving. So he, he says to me, so, you know, I've never hired an acting coach. What is it you do? I look at him, and I said, I don't know. <laughs> he looked at me and said, you're hired. Because he, he got it. You know, I, there's no recipe. Everything what comes in front of you, you have to step inside that world and figure out what it is you're dealing with from whatever you guys want to be. You know, that's it. And um, I, I don't know. It's just like passion is the way to get there. I think you, if you come from that place, you're coming from a truth, your truth, whatever that is for you, that's where you want to come from. Now, other, last story is I was invited back to my graduate alma mater, alma mater Smith College. And they wanted me to do a five-day choreography workshop with a select group of graduate students. So I thought, OK, this will be fun. And the faculty decided to have a dinner afterwards. I thought, OK, we're going to talk, relax, tell you each other what you did, what the intensity was like, all this kind of stuff. So uh, one student came up to me, and she said, um, so do you think I have what it takes to make it in New York as a dancer? 
my mind's going, this chick came to three of the five classes. I'm like, going, honey, you don't. <laughs> and she went, what? <laughs> she goes, why not? And I said, well, you came to three of the five classes. And well, I had tests, I had papers, whatever. And I said, look, you can't let that distract you for something that's supposed to mean so much to you, right? I said, here I am, the very animal you want to become, and you don't show up to my class. You're probably not going to make it. You know, you don't, dance isn't something you do to get rich. <laughs> you know, it's a big deal if you work enough to collect unemployment. You know, it's definitely the stepchild of the arts. Um, I'd like to say, you know, to you, I found my passion through adversity. My hope that is each and every one of you will make a decision to find yours. My job is to please, to, to encourage you to take that red pill, the unknown. Thank you.